let me first say that uh, this research stream is co-authored with Yan Liu, um, my student at Duke University, but we're gonna go way back. We're gonna go back millions of years to the Serengeti. And I'm gonna talk about the evolutionary foundations of overfitting, something very important to all of us. And my paper is basically about trying to separate factors that are just found by luck and factors that might actually be real. And I'll propose a method to actually do that. So let's go back millions of years. It's a gazelle in the Serengeti. And there's a rustling sound in the grass. So the gazelle takes off. And it turns out the rustling sound was the wind. So this was a type one error. The gazelle thought it was something bad, turned out that it wasn't, but the gazelle expended valuable energy taking off. That's a type one error. I'm gonna be talking a lot about type one and type two. Uh, the type two error is, is kind of obvious. If the gazelle didn't take off, thinking, oh, it's just the wind, then the downside is pretty severe um, death. Okay, so the idea here is that the ones that uh, basically thought about this type one, type two, so the very high type one error took off a lot, these were the ones that actually survived. Okay, so is it possible um, that uh, our predisposition to taking type one errors is evolutionary? Okay, so uh, let's continue uh, with the famous uh, B.F. Skinner uh, experiment, 1947. So basically the experiment is pigeons in a cage. And there's nobody that can be seen by the pigeons, and the pigeons are fed every three hours. Okay, exactly every three hours. So after a while, uh, Skinner noticed something very interesting, that one of the pigeons, just before the food showed up, turned around. And continued to do that every single time the food was dropped. Even though the food is being dropped mechanically. There's nothing to do with the behavior. Another pigeon was doing this, just before the food was dropped. Okay, so his paper has to do with the genesis of superstition, or at least that's what he called it. So just by chance, that first pigeon happened to turn around right at the beginning when the food was first dropped, and maybe the second time also, and they inferred, they overfit. They inferred something that wasn't actually there. The same with the other pigeon. Okay, so again, um, this isn't a, a demonstration, he calls it superstition, but it could actually be um, uh, less politically correct uh, and, and cover a broader range of beliefs. Okay, so there's pigeons, gazelles, what about um, people? Okay, introduce uh, Klaus Conrad, famous uh, book actually in 1958, and he coins the phrase apophony. So it's basically, you see something that really isn't there from a pattern. So again, it's kind of like overfitting uh, to the data. And there's some famous examples of apophony, uh, the uh, so-called uh, sculpture on the moon was probably the most famous one. But maybe you could say that we weren't actually at the moon at that time when it was observed, and, and you never knew. There's a small probability of a civilization there. Um, this one is a little uh, more clear, um, if you can see it. It looks like God in the clouds. And the last one is the most famous. And I know uh, some of you have seen this, so don't ruin it. The toast. So <laughs> it's like Jesus and the toast. So you know that you put the toast in enough times it's gonna pixelize, if you, I'm not sure what the grains of uh, bread are called, not pixels, but it's gonna look something like this eventually. So you see this, 
And th this, is, this is not Jesus. This is just something that's random. So uh, apophony is uh, a type 1 error. It's a false insight. And of course, epiphany is a true insight. So, so basically, um, people tend to read a lot into patterns. And there's a, a, a book, I'm not sure if you've read it, um, by Carl Sagan uh, in 1995. It's a great read. It's free on the internet. And uh, it's called The Demon Haunted World. And he actually also has this evolutionary interpretation of pattern recognition. So humans are incredibly good at recognizing at a very early age the face of their parents. So he actually makes the case that those that are, that are good at this pattern recognition, um, basically it's eventually hardwired. This is a, a very cute kid, right? And smiling at the mother uh, or maybe even the father, okay? In contrast, you could have a situation like this kid, Battle Axe. Um, and, and, and basically, he makes the case that the children that uh, didn't recognize or didn't give the smile uh, to the parents early on, they actually were treated differently. And uh, there's me as a kid. <laughs> and uh, I got one more. <laughs> How about this kid? <laughs> so, so this is, uh, of course, an average effect. There are certain exceptions, uh, like Ray Dalio, um, CEO of Bridgewater. <laughs> he, d despite uh, um, evolution, he's done well. Um, OK. <laughs> OK, so where am I going here? This is uh, a real slide from a seminar uh, internal seminar at, uh, at uh, Man AHL, a firm that I do some work for. And we look at you know, many different strategies. This one was presented. It looks really good. Uh, it's daily data. It's got a sharp of one. Um, it has a small drawdown right at the beginning, like minus 6% in the first year. It does great during the financial crisis. Uh, if we calculate um, a, a T statistic, it's uh, 2.91. And so it's, it's, it's almost three sigma uh, from zero. So it looks pretty good until you think of the possibility that it's Jesus in the toast. And indeed, it is. Okay, so this is basically 200 simulations. And the mean is set at zero. So each of these simulations is done under the assumption of no skill whatsoever. And all I did is I picked off the very top one. And it's going to look really good. OK, so this is dangerous. Now just think about what's happening here, that we've already heard that many different investment strategies are proposed. And I've just randomly generated some numbers. And it looked really good. OK, so this, this is the theme of, of my talk. The good news is that I've got a paper um, that actually attempts to make an, a correction for this type of situation. And um, actually, that second page lists all of the papers that are available. And you can click on them uh, with the slides on the website. So uh, I've got a way to uh, basically haircut um, the Sharpe ratio. And actually, uh, my discussant, um, Marcos, has, has got another uh, method that's addressing a very similar problem, and uh, that's the, the probability of overfitting. So we've made some progress uh, in this dimension, and I think it's been good progress. And this is just an example of um, my method uh, in a paper called backtesting, where uh, this is the percentage haircut of a Sharpe ratio. And uh, this is done uh, assuming the number of tests were 100. So 100 things were actually tried. And this is how uh, to make an adjustment. Rather than just doing like a blanket haircut of 50% is often done for a back test, this tells you exactly how much to haircut the Sharpe ratio depending upon the number of tests. My technique takes sample size into account. Uh, if there's autocorrelation, 
that's easily taken into account. Um, the number of tests, the graph I showed you was 100, but you can specify this program is available on the internet for free. Uh, you can do uh, the number of tests, um, indeed the correlation uh, of the tests also, because if you've got 100 strategies that are all highly correlated, that's not 100 tests. Okay, and indeed, if they're perfectly correlated, it's one test. Okay, so uh, this can be applied directly to uh, a maximal uh, sharp ratio. You're going to hear, I'm sure, from Marcos uh, about maximal sharp ratios. Okay, this is an example of applying my idea. This is a competition run by CQA, um, 28 student groups, some of them um, from very good schools like uh, Chicago, Booth, uh, Caltech. Um, basically, it's equity long short uh, for about five months or six months. And these are the final annualized sharp ratios. But of course, there are 28 teams doing this. One could just be lucky. And that's exactly what my technique goes after. So it's also a fairly short sample. So when I run my program uh, to haircut these sharp ratios, a little discouraging, I showed this at CQA, because they're about to hand out the prize from the top uh, group. There you go. That's what the sharp ratio is haircut to. Okay, not much there. So <laughs> maybe that's what we would expect. Uh, actually, gotta admit, the Duke group was there too, um, and uh, we didn't do that well. What I'm gonna talk about today is, okay, that's what I've kind of done in the past. Where I'm going in the future is the following. I can provide a haircut for a sharp ratio for a strategy or for a factor, um, but the research that I've done is looking at basically one at a time. So for example, I could take Brian's factor that you just heard and I could look at its uh, T ratio and I think I would have passed my test um, because it was more than three sigma. But it's another question, how do you combine his factor and other factors into like, uh, like a portfolio. So which factors are the most important? Again, that's the title of my paper, Lucky Factors. You don't want to invest in something that just shows up with an um, average return that's positive by, by fluke. The problem that we face is also in this graph. So I picked off the very top strategy. It had a T ratio of 2.91. But if I take the top 10 and equally weight them, it looks way better, way better. And maybe not unexpected, because these are uncorrelated strategies. They're just randomly generated with no cross-correlation assumed. Okay, so if you look at it, it goes to 4.5. Okay, so we need a technique to, to be able to identify a group of strategies and declare them either true or not true. So this is uh, obviously relevant for, uh, for many people. So it could be the in-house evaluation of strategies, which I tend to do a lot at, at Man Group. Um, it's also how do you evaluate a fund manager? And, um, and of course the factors that we've heard about. There's many, many factors, over 300 factors uh, have been published. Published, that's the key word. Because many more out there that have not been published. This is um, from the Capital, uh, S&P Capital IQ uh, website. They've actually got 450 factors. How do we deal with that? Okay, so how do we know which ones are real and which ones are not? Okay, so basically what we're gonna do is to propose a method um, that's gonna control for data mining, and it's gonna be very general, and actually it applies to a broader range of problems than simply selecting the best group of factors. So let me kind of try to go through this, uh, and, uh, and, and I'll go through some intuition to start with. Suppose we have 100 X variables, and we want to explain why, or think about forecasting why, and um, we've got 100 candidates that we're gonna actually look at. Okay, so we need to decide on the type of model, so what kind of regression model we're actually gonna use, 
And sometimes we'll use a panel data where we put everything together. Um, sometimes we'll use a Fama Macbeth uh, style model when we've got many different Y variables. We need to figure out what is significant, and it's going to be a real challenge. Okay, because if you simply use a two sigma rule, a T ratio of two, there's a 99% chance that you're going to find something with a T ratio of two or greater that is a fluke. A 99% chance. And maybe it makes sense. You try 100 things, something is going to show up randomly. Okay, so we need to be able to control for that. That's multiple testing. It's very important. This is not a one-shot test. This is not one X explaining one Y. I've got 100 different possibilities. Something's going to look good by chance, and we need to control uh, for that. We also need to control for the dependency across the different X variables. As I said earlier, that if all the Xs are really, really similar, that's closer to a single test than if we had all of the Xs being completely different and uncorrelated. The next part is I've kind of already established some rules for uh, figuring out what the first factor is, but what about the second? Okay, so it kind of makes sense that if you identify one thing, then uh, what you're really interested in is the incremental contribution of the next variable. So how do we actually uh, do that? Uh, when do we stop? How many factors are there? Okay, so that's uh, where I'm going. Again, it, this is a, a very general framework. It's going to take correlation into account. It's actually going to take very general distributional assumptions into account. So uh, if your data is, is highly non-normal, that's fine. This technique will work, um, it, 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 uh, at least uh, in the exercises that I've done. So, so let's, let's actually go. Let me uh, first give hat tip to, um, to two important papers. The first paper is um, written by uh, three people that were uh, colleagues of mine at Duke University. And, and actually, I never took the paper that seriously, but uh, I knew it was a good paper. But in going back and reading it, it, it is a, a great paper. And they had very simple idea they were talking about predictability of like stock returns and how do you interpret uh, like a T statistic in um, or an R squared when you're proposing some variable to predict stock returns. And what they did is they said, well, let's just simulate some data. And that, that doesn't have any hardwired uh, predictability with the Y variable and then just run some regressions and see what the distribution of the R square is under the null of no predictability. And just by chance, you're going to get some variables that are just random that predict the stock returns. So their idea was to use that null idea to actually um, make some inference as to what the R square needed to be to establish true predictability uh, in stock returns. So very good idea. And the second paper that's very important is a paper by White in 2000. And uh, he talks about um, how to use the max statistic, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. I'm going to go through a number of examples uh, to show you that the technique that I'm proposing is incredibly simple uh, to implement. So, so let's uh, go through the steps. There's basically nine steps. OK, so again, let's say we've got um, uh, a Y variable and um, 100 possible X variables. Okay? So you could kind of think of this uh, in a spreadsheet. And let's say we've got 500 observations. So the first column, column A, is the Y variable. And then you've got 500 columns of uh, the X variables. Okay? So I'm going to do something uh, to the data. What I'm going to do is I'm going to orthogonalize every single X variable. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do is to run a regression and take out any possible predict predictability of X on Y. Okay, that means with the orthogonalized X's, and there's 500 of them, that if I regressed Y on the orthogonalized X, the R squared is exactly zero. I've stripped out 
all of the predictability. Okay, so I'm not doing any simulation here. This is real data, but I've just stripped out any relation between X and Y. Okay, the next step is, is a bootstrap. Okay, and I know some of you know how to do this, uh, but just let me kind of remind you how that works. Think of what I've got here as this block of data. Uh, it's got 500 rows. In the first column, I've got my Y. And then the next 500 columns, I've got my orthogonalized Xs. And what I'm going to do is to draw a new set of data from that data by randomly sampling rows. So maybe the first row I sample is row number 8, then number 28, then number 420. Just keep on doing that with replacement until I fill out a new matrix that has got my resampled Y and my orthogonalized Xs. Okay? And it could have missing months. It could have months that are repeated. Okay? It's based on the same data. I've simply resampled it. Okay, so I've got my new data set, which is the first bootstrap, and then I'm going to run 100 regressions. So Y is going to be regressed on X1, and I'm just going to keep on doing that for every single one, and I'm going to save the maximum R squared, or the maximum T statistic. Okay, so this data, because it's orthogonalized, it's basically under the null. It shouldn't explain why. Remember, I've stripped out the uh, predictability. But by chance, in this bootstrap resampling, there's going to be some of these resampled Xs that actually predict the resampled Ys. So I'm going to save the max, okay? And then I'm going to repeat. I'm going to do it again. So repeat steps two and three 10,000 times. And what I get is a histogram of the distribution of the maximal T ratio, or R squared, whatever you want to choose, I get. Okay? So this is what I've got from this exercise. And what I'm going to do is compare that distribution to the actual data. And if it's the case that, um, let's say, in my bootstrap data, um, the 95th percentile of the T's that I find is, let's say, 3, and in the actual data, the best T I've got is 2.5, I stop. I'm done. There's no X that significantly explains Y. If it's the case that in the real data, I've got something that's 4 sigma or T ratio of 4, that exceeds the 95th percentile, and I declare that factor to be true. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to do is to take that true factor, and I, I say here, let's say it's um, the seventh uh, X. What I'm going to do, and this is the trick in my paper, what I'm going to do now is to go back and restart this exercise, except now what I'm going to do is orthogonalize the Y with respect to the true factor. So what I'm going to do is to take the stuff in Y that's not explained by the factor that I've declared as true. Okay, so that, that is basically my step six. Step seven, I got to reorthogonalize all my x variables, but now there's 99 of them because one of them has been declared true. And you can guess where I'm going. I basically just repeat this. I look at the distribution of the max under the data, under the null of no predictability or explanatory power, and then I compare that to um, to the actual data. And I keep on doing this until it's the case that in the real data, it doesn't, the T ratio does not exceed the threshold uh, in the bootstrap data. So this is a way, it's very simple to implement, this is a way that we can actually go and, and, and identify a group of factors. It takes um, correlation into account, 
Because remember, I'm sampling a row, so it's preserved. It takes very general distributional assumptions into account because I'm using the actual data. I'm not simulating a Gaussian distribution or anything like that. I'm using the actual data. If there's tails in the data, that's going to be there when I'm resampling. The other thing is that uh, potentially it could allow for time dependence. So instead of sampling a row, I could sample a number of rows, like a block of a year. Okay, so I can take that into account too. It takes the data mining into account. So basically, it's doing the four things that we actually want to do in a very simple way. And it allows us to identify uh, how many factors or how many factors we're lucky. OK, so let me, let me go through some applications quickly. Um, and, uh, and, and basically, let me also um, link to the Fama French uh, 2010 paper. Um, that basically is on luck versus school, or skill and uh, mutual fund uh, evaluation. And basically what they do is kind of similar uh, to what we're doing in a way, but uh, we depart from what they do. So think of having 5,000 mutual funds. Uh, what they do is strip out the alpha from everybody. Okay, And then they do the resampling, like I suggested, taking a row of 500 or 5,000, and then just keep on doing that. And then you could actually look at the, at the performance of each of these resampled uh, mutual funds. Okay, so um, that in the original data, because we stripped out the alphas, is going to be zero exactly. But in the resampled data, who knows what it's going to be? It's just unlikely to be zero. And that's basically what they do. Um, and uh, it is a little different than, than what we do in that we do this sequentially using the max and we actually add, once we identify a fund that uh, we would consider uh, truly outperforming or underperforming, we put them back into the, into the null. And that's a key difference between what we do and what they do and indeed a reason why our results are different uh, than their results. So it's very analogous to finding a factor. And once you've got that factor, you put it into the regression and look for the incremental uh, factor. This is what it actually looks like. This is the actual, the blue is the actual um, T ratios in the data. Okay, so I've just ordered them uh, by percentiles. So it's the actual data. And then the two lines above are the fifth and the 95th percentile of the bootstrap distribution that has no skill in it. We strip the alphas actually out of it. So a couple of things are, are kind of interesting. The first thing is that there's no skill here. So on the far right, um, basically um, there's, there's nobody um, that exceeds the 95th percentile. Okay, more interesting is the lack of skill. And it looks like many, notice that many uh, funds with that blue line are below that fifth percentile. And, and basically, um, we need to figure out who is significantly underperforming. So again, using my technique, uh, you can do this. And, and this is with basically uh, taking the worst 1% of the funds, putting them back in uh, to the bootstrap, except putting in their negative alphas rather than zeros and then continuing the exercise. And when I do this with the 1%, there's still many that are underperforming. And I keep on doing this until I get to the 8% level. And basically, I declare that 8% of the mutual funds significantly underperform once we control for non-normalities, correlation, data mining, all of this stuff. So this is a way to deliver an actual cutoff. Another um, example, and I really appreciate actually some of the uh, S&P Capital IQ uh, people are, are here. Um, they read my paper and said, oh, we've got, we've got a, a great application, our 450 factors. Okay, so I got an email at like five in the morning yesterday with the results. So I appreciate them basically pulling an all-nighter uh, to provide some slides for, uh, for me. And, and basically they examined, um, uh, 
293 factors. I'll just show uh, the analysis that they did uh, looking at the most recent data in terms of uh, performance of the factors. And again, it's a very similar uh, kind of graph. Um, it, it looks a little different in that uh, with the mutual funds, which is a huge number with negative T ratios. Now we're many more with positive T ratios. Again, the, the green here is the actual data and the distribution of the data is in the other uh, colors. So it looks like there's a, a very large number of potentially significant factors. And this is done uh, with the Russell uh, 3K. And when you actually do it, um, do the method that I suggested, go through the nine steps, uh, 15 of those factors uh, survive. Okay, and this again is on a fairly short sample. Um, it's interesting, and this is, uh, might be something, um, actually Cliff has a paper uh, recently talking about exactly this point. Um, if we go to another universe, like S&P 500, and do the same factors, form them the same way, uh, nothing is significant, and the mid-cap, uh, the same thing. So basically what this is showing is much of the significance is coming from very small caps, and none of this really takes into account transactions costs. So again, this is just a very simple application. Um, the last thing that I'll talk about um, is uh, a, kind of a, a more standard in the academic literature, how do we evaluate uh, factors? So again, I mentioned that my paper, um, the, uh, which is called dot, 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 and the cross-section of expected returns, does one factor at a time. So what I decided to do was to look at 13 uh, widely cited factors, and, and you probably know uh, most of them, um, the Fama French factors, we've got um, Rob Stanbaugh's PSL factor, we've got Cliff Asinus's quality minus junk, which I'm sure we'll hear about uh, at lunchtime, um, and the most recent uh, Fama French uh, factors right at the bottom, CMA and our MW. This is just a graph from my uh, previous paper where I suggest new cutoffs for significance. And you can see that uh, some factors uh, fail and some factors uh, exceed the new threshold. The old threshold is two sigma going across here. The new threshold taking multiple testing into account is up here. And you can recognize some of the popular factors that uh, do well and some of them that don't do well, like SMB. I'm gonna do an illustration only. Okay, so this is, uh, this is not me declaring these factors are like the ultimately true factors. This is just an illustration of how the technique actually works. Okay, so the weakness in this particular application is that I need to specify portfolios. It's the same thing that Brian uh, did and the same thing that Rob did in his discussion. This is gonna be a regression method. It's a panel regression that looks at both time series and cross section, and we need to specify portfolios, okay, for this to work. So um, I'm gonna do the classic, as Rob did, the classic uh, Fama French uh, size and book to market sort of portfolios. These are the average returns of the 13 factors that I look at through 2012, the correlations, and then basically I need some evaluation metrics. So I'm gonna look at things that are popular in the literature, like the median absolute intercept. Remember I've got like 25 portfolios, I'll look at that intercept. I want the intercept to be zero, ideally. Right, so if the model really works, then the alpha should be zero. Okay, so look at the median absolute uh, intercept, the mean absolute intercept, uh, and then a couple of other measures that are uh, used in, in other papers. These are, are ways for me to evaluate, and uh, essentially, I will do this again. Um, uh, think of this as, um, again, the same thing I've talked about. I get a null distribution where I orthogonalize these factors so that they do not have any predictability. This is what happens. The first run, I identify the first factor, and it turns out to be the classic sharp uh, factor, the beta. That's the first one that actually comes in. 
Okay, and you can see these uh, across the, um, the columns are the different metrics that I'm actually using. So I would identify that one first, and then I'm gonna pull that in, and then the next test is gonna have to be incremental to what I've already identified. Okay, so I'm taking this one as true, and, I, and the test is what the second factor can do over and above uh, the first factor. When I do that, it turns out and again, this is only for illustration, that one of the Fama French uh, factor number four or five, I forget which one it is, uh, it comes in. It's actually pretty close call, um, but this technique would say this is the second factor. Okay, so let's, this is how it works. So I've given three illustrations as to how this actually works, but let me um, kind of end by talking about something that um, is, is maybe uh, exciting to me. You change the portfolios, you change the slope, right? So, and I've always been bothered by this, uh, this thing that the Fama French uh, value and size portfolio works really well if you sort portfolios by, by size and value. Or momentum does really well if you have portfolios that are sorted by momentum. So it's kind of like you're using the sort for the portfolios, but then you're using the same factors so, and the, the fact that these results are not robust across different sorts, wouldn't it be nice um, to get rid of the actual portfolios? Let me just uh, end by saying that th the logic of portfolios I totally understand, right? You reduce the noise, and, that, and that's valuable. Um, and, and you're able to get big spread and expect the returns, so that increases power. And the covariance matrix that you estimate, that's it's feasible to estimate okay, in portfolios. It isn't feasible to estimate uh, for individual stocks. But um, my recent research basically um, suggests that, well, yeah, it's true, those individual stocks are noisy. That's a cost. There's also a cost to doing the portfolio exercise. You don't know how to sort what order to sort. There's so many different uh, rules that you actually use uh, to actually do that. Why not actually go and use the individual stocks? And indeed, those metrics that I was showing you, the M1, M2, M3 metrics, none of them use the covariance metrics. So I don't even, I don't even need to estimate that. Okay, so my idea here is that we can apply um, uh, this, this selection method that I'm proposing to individual stocks rather than um, to uh, these portfolios. So I've not done that research yet. It's basically written down. Uh, we've got some preliminary results, but I think it would be nice to move beyond uh, the portfolios into something um, that isn't kind of arbitrary in terms of the sorts. To end, uh, this is something from um, the American Statistical Association has got ethical guidelines, and, uh, and one of the messages that I've got is that we need to be really careful about multiplicity of tests. Okay? This is very clear. Um, selecting the one significant result from a multiplicity of parallel tests poses a grave risk of incorrect conclusion. Okay? And they actually call it highly misleading. And unfortunately, that's where we are today. Okay, we've been using rules that have been inappropriate. Two sigma rule for identifying uh, a strategy as significant, uh, that just doesn't work when you've got over 300 factors that have actually been tried. Okay, so we need to increase the hurdle, and my research advocates a way to do that that actually takes the information that's relevant, the number of tests, the correlations, all of that into account. And then the next step, which I proposed in this paper, is, is to actually go and, uh, and try to identify a group of factors, not just one at a time. So take the correlation into account. This application, this bootstrap application, I've applied to factor selection, but it actually applies very generally. So the usual stuff that, that we do 
uh, we're using all of the data. We estimate betas and look at the correlation between the betas and the average returns. This also applies in a fama macbeth style regression at every single point in time you're running a regression. So in my paper, I work out all of the analytics, analytics for that. And that's really nice because it allows the betas, the risk loadings, to change through time. Okay, so there's a way to do that. But even more generally, in any regression, I don't care if it's in finance or, or, or another field, this method provides a way, if you've got a number of different candidate things you're looking at, it provides a way to select the ones that are significant. Okay, and I say significant, I should put quotations on it. So basically, I'm uh, effectively changing, I hope, the way that we think about p-values. We're used to thinking about, well, t-ratio of two, p-value 0 0.05, that's significant. That is not significant in terms of multiple testing. So it turns out that the message from my research is, is pretty um, uh, bold, maybe. Um, quote, more than half of the reported empirical findings in financial economics are likely false. Okay? Um, I thought my colleagues would be upset at me uh, for this, um, but it turns out that over half of my empirical research in finance is false. Okay, so it's me, too. So it's a lot easier uh, to make this talk uh, when you're pointing the finger at yourself. Um, by extrapolation, more than half of the financial products that are sold to investors purporting to outperform are false. Okay, it's pretty clear. Um, the finding, my finding, shouldn't be that shocking because 10 years ago, a paper was published in um, an A-level uh, medical journal that basically had the conclusion that over half of the medical research that was published was false. And basically, that paper 10 years ago said, oh, we didn't take into account multiple testing. Well, we're a little behind by 10 years, but I think that people um, need to change the way that we actually evaluate um, with statistics. Maybe there is this evolutionary predisposition to have a high type one error, but for me it's just too high. And we need to, to balance this. I provide some, way, some ways to reduce that type two error. And I think in the bottom line, many of you are practitioners of finance. I've been very um, pleased by the reception that this paper's got by practitioners because you want to do the right thing for your client. You don't want to sell the client snake oil. If it's a fluke, then it's not going to make any money for you. You're going to lose the client, and it's going to cost you reputation. So I've got some tools here that will hopefully help, uh, and, and I think it's the, the right way uh, to go forward. But of course, I'm biased. Okay, thank you. So I guess the question is, Apparently, we are 15 years behind or 10 years behind uh, medical research, where they have done this sort of uh, search soling a long time ago. By the way, Ioannidis is still alive. Uh, his, le his life has not been threatened by uh, his research, and we hope that Professor Harvey's uh, <laughs> life is not threatened either. So the point is, yes, most uh, empirical discoveries in finance may actually be wrong. Um, we just cannot know. We, 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 at this point, we cannot know which ones are right or wrong. And um, we need a new methodology to uh, determine more accurately um, what is the effect, this inflationary effect that multiple tests have in uh, the p-value. So um, I guess where do we begin? Let's try to understand um, the source, the, the key source of the problem. P-value inflation has many causes, but essentially it's lottery playing, the one that is most at fault. This situation where we can try experiments, thousands, tens of thousands, millions, billions of experiments, and we only end up publishing the one we like. 
And in fact, um, in a research that I published with Professor Bailey and, and Borwin, two mathematicians, we essentially proved that uh, any ridiculously high p-value is guaranteed, or p low p-value, high t stat value is guaranteed. We, you just need to keep trying, and essentially you will always achieve something that is statistically significant on random data, any sort of random data, and we will see a, a simulation of that. So what do we do about it? And s something that I very much like about uh, Cam's paper is that it does not only point out to a problem, but it points out to a solution. So if you're familiar with your Nidhi's paper, it was really like poking an eye, but there was no escape. It's everything is wrong and, and now we have to figure out how to solve it. But Cam's paper actually comes with uh, batteries included. And here is how we can get out of this mess. As you know, well, this is something that has been with us for 70, 80 years, perhaps even longer. Um, the, the framework, the statistical framework we use for um, evaluating hypotheses. And at that time, it really made sense because we didn't have access to supercomputers, or back in those days, people didn't have access to supercomputers. They didn't have access to an incredible wealth of data so essentially, every statistical test was a one shot. Um, there are some papers uh, back in 1905 by Pearson, Carl Pearson, and he shows, um, he, he tries to determine whether um, a species of, um, of um, I think, crabs in Naples, yes, yeah, exactly, whether there was a divergence in the evolution, whether a new species was emerging and essentially he applied the test on some data that had been collected by someone else and it was the only data available in the world. So yes, when Pearson applied those tests, he was not running into that problem. So back in the day when um, this name and Pearson framework um, was, um, was designed for statistical testing, it really made sense. There was, no, there was not this threat, but now it's all the opposite. And this is the quote that uh, Cam made uh, mention to. It's truly notorious. It's, it's something that the statisticians are very aware of. It's something that, uh, unfortunately, has not permeated um, into the finance profession. But certainly, um, biomedical research, they are very aware, and, and they, that's why there is a project called alltrials.net project where pharma researchers are mandated um, in order to qualify for some you know, kind of certificate on, in this program. They are mandated to publicize all the results, positive or negative, of a, of a research. All right, so let me give you a, an example uh, that I work with uh, Borwin and Bailey. And again, our results are consistent with uh, Cam's results. Suppose that... Um, we have a, um, we generate a random sample of returns. Nothing is, you know, just IID normal returns and um, we apply some random trading rule for buying and selling. It could be that you buy the first, you are long in the first return, you are short every five returns and you flip, whatever rule. Eventually, well, what you end up having is you do this, um, you come up with thousands of these random rules and you will come up with a very large number of strategies, each of them with a sharp ratio. If we pick the strategy with the maximum sharp ratio after uh, one trial, well, that maximum is bounded by a certain amount. Now, if we run, if, if we run 10 experiments, 10 alternative random rules, there is a different bound. And what Bailey and Borwin and myself, what we did, uh, and we published this in the notices of the American Mathematical Society, what we did is we computed this upper bound, and that's this uh, red equation that you can see there. Essentially what it says is that the expected value of the maximum of the random sharp ratios is, bound, is, is approximated as but it converges very quickly after even like four or five experiments, it's already very close, um, to this expression. And this expression has two very interesting components. 
Uh, number one, there is a square root of the variance of the sharp ratios. This variance is not the variance of the estimator of the sharp ratio, it's the variance across the sharp ratios that have been computed. And why is this relevant? What this tells you is that when you apply, when you look for wild alternative models, you are increasing the variance of the results. So for instance, if, if we were looking for a very specific theoretically driven trading strategy, this variance would be very small. Why? Because we are willing to accept only some feasible explanations for the, the market drivers. However, if we, if we take the, um, I, I guess we take the catalog of um, alternative trading strategies like technical analysis, which again is not necessarily wrong, we just don't know if this is correct, technical analysis and uh, seasonal effects, there are thousands of alternative uh, trading strategies out there. They are so widely different that this variance grows very quickly. And as you can see, there is a blue line and there is a red line on top that is, uh, clearly dominates. That's the effect of just doubling the variance, if we just double the variance. So this equation tells you that when you're willing to accept any sort of theoret of, of um, empirically driven theory, if, you are, if your research is empirically driven and you are willing to accept any theory provided by the data, this variance is going to grow very quickly. And after, after 40, 50 experiments, you are already we, uh, achieving sharp ratios of, annual sharp ratios of three, four, five. This equation tells you do theory-driven research, number one, and number two, there is an n component there in that equation. That, that's the number of trials, independent trials to be precise. And it also tells you, well, you have to control, you, and that's something that Cam explained very well, you have to control how many uh, times you are flipping the coin, how many times you are rolling the die, how many times you are playing roulette. And so Berkeley Lab, um, I'm affiliated with, with that lab. So we came up with the idea of, well, you know, let's, all this is very nice, we have a mathematical proof, but people want to see the tangible reality, right? How hard is it to produce a, an amazing trading strategy? And the answer is, it takes two minutes, more or less, right? So essentially what we did is we developed this algorithm that um, generates some random returns, searches through 10,000 or so, variation of random calendar strategies, like for instance, what happens if you are long between Monday and, and Wednesday, and then you short and double down. So there are thousands of alternative combinations. And please visit this website and try this simulation tool, because it really tells you that there is no merit in producing a nice looking backtest. A computer can do it for you in a matter of two minutes. So whenever you receive an investment proposal with a nice, a nice backtest, it just doesn't mean anything. Your, your work begins there in asking questions to this investment advisor or whoever brings you this proposal and ask, well, how many trials? How did you control for the number of trials? How do you know that uh, people run trials outside your system? And there is a, a common thread, I guess, you know, Cam's paper, uh, my paper, um, address this problem, but there is a still, um, there is no silver bullet for this. There will always be the situation where uh, people um, are not aware of the actual number of trials. So let me give you an example. Suppose that I hire someone from Goldman Sachs and um, I tell him, well, you know, let's run some strategy um, for trading bonds around auctions. And everything is scrutinized, you know, we know exactly the number of trials that he's going to run, the number of, of times he pulled the data, the number of backtests that, that he ran through our backtest platform. And we know that, you know, maybe he ran three trials and he came up with a great strategy. So we go to our analysis and we say, yes, that's great, three. You know, the odds of this being overfeed are very low. But the reality is that whether he is aware or not, he has worked for another financial firm where someone ran 200 results and came up with something really neat 
and he was never aware of the number of trials because he has just been told that it's good to go short the five years and then you know three year, three days before the, the auction and then go long. So it's still there is a, this problem that I guess will never be unsolved, and it is the leakage of information. You can control the number of experiments, the number of trials that um, you are computing, but in re the reality is you will never know how many trials actually took place because part of what you are trying is a result of the thousands of trials that, that someone else did and then communicated to you. So, okay, let's now look at, well, there is, there is this solution that we provide for the particular case of the sharp ratio. So again, my work is as, as a um, portfolio manager, so I'm mostly interested in, in identifying a strategy. So there is a way to deflate the sharp ratio, which is to introduce this upper bound of the sharp ratio as the um, threshold for the sharp ratio. But let me finalize with um, the, the right side of all this. We have to debunk uh, three important myths, I believe, that um, we have inherited uh, from uh, statistical research and from really decades of the way the peer review process works. Number one, p-values do not give us the probability that the finding is random. It just, they don't. They give us, it's just, it's, it, they give us what is the probability that some hypothetical study using some well-behaved data, random well-behaved data, like normally distributed, et cetera, would deliver a similar result. So it's not a statement. Uh, it, it will never be useful to, val to validate a finding. It's just not what they do. Number two, um, some methodologies that, by the way, come from statistics like the holdout method, the uh, curve fitting, they are not useful. They are useful for other things, but they are, not they are not keeping us out of trouble because they do not control for the number of trials. Essentially, you can run a holdout thousands of times and until the holdout gives you a, a result that you like. And number three, uh, simpler models are not necessarily safer. Uh, it could very well be that we have a simpler model, like the backtest overfitting tool, and still it will always deliver you a good result, no matter what, no matter how long the, the series. Why is this a problem in finance? Well, it's a problem in finance for two reasons. Number one, we don't have laboratories. We cannot, we cannot determine whether Mr. Sarao caused the, the flash crash, right? There is a spoofing, there was a spoofing involved, but we cannot rerun the events of, the, of those days without um, his action. And number two, Unfortunately, in finance, actually, uh, investment managers reduce the signal-to-noise ratio, and they're changing the game all the time. So we know that signals are always going to be very weak because of this arbitrage that is not present in other areas of research like astronomy or biology. There is no arbitrage argument there. So, well, there are some things we can do. My time is, is, is gone. Um, but please go ahead with any questions you may have. Thank you, Marco. This is really, um, I, I've just got two remarks. You mentioned alltrials.net, and I'm not sure you've followed what's happening with uh, pharma right now. So in pharma, you rely upon a randomized, randomized uh, controlled trial, RCT. And it turns out that many of the trials that the pharma's actually sponsored are never revealed. So, so there's a push right now to reveal all of the past clinical trials that have taken uh, place. And you kind of see where this is going. You do like 10 trials, nine of them fail. You don't disclose the nine, and the 10th supports your drug. Then you go through the process. So uh, alltrials.net, I would highly uh, recommend um, in, in terms of uh, what's happening in, in the medical uh, side. Uh, the last thing I'll mention before questions is uh, a discussion that Marcos and I have actually had um, in, in the past, and it's kind of an active uh, idea. And this is that, well, maybe we should think about how much type 1 error and type 2 error 
is optimal for our application. So maybe it's not a big deal in medicine that half of the findings are, are false. They've got a huge type 1 error, but they've got a very small type 2 error. So basically, the logic is you don't want to miss the cure for cancer. Okay? And you could easily miss it, right? Because it might be in your trial, uh, it's marginal. So maybe you want, maybe it's optimal to have uh, a very high uh, type 1 error. You think of other applications. So you've got a mission to Mars, a manned mission to Mars, right? You cannot afford any part to fail. Okay, so that informs your trade-off of type 1 and type 2 errors. Okay, so, so the idea is, well, let's kind of figure out what that trade-off should be. And as managers, um, you recognize what that trade-off is. And that's consistent with what the management of your firm actually wants and what your investors actually want. I think it is a different situation uh, in terms of uh, establishing a new factor than uh, establishing potentially a cure for cancer. Okay, so I think we need to take that into account. But I'm um, open to questions. Yes. My question is about the type two error risk and how it differs between the academics publishing a factor that actually ends up being false and the death outcome to the career of that intellectual kind of finding versus in the practitioner world, the type two is pretty much a mean zero minus T cost so if you have a basket, some of it is random, some of it is not, you're still facing a positive mean that just been, the noise has been inserted versus the type one risk is you accepted HML and momentum and then 2007 quant crash wipes you out like everybody else. And the quants that seem to have more diversification through maybe idea mining in the first place and then data mining. <laughs> I uh, survived that a little bit better, and at the end of the day, have, were more factor diversified. Right, so uh, good question, and it actually does speak to that last point that I was making, to actually establish what that trade-off is. Um, for the academic, um, I actually only sampled, uh, for my 316 published factors, top journals. So really the top three journals in finance, there are like hundreds of journals in finance and economics. I didn't bother to look there. I didn't bother to look at SSRN. There's thousands of things that are out there. It's really easy to do. And I think maybe you're right that um, the downside of publishing something that turns out to be false is pretty limited uh, in terms of the academic uh, side. What's maybe more interesting is on um, the practitioner side. And, uh, and, and basically, my idea is the following. Um, there are two types of mistakes that you can make. So one mistake, you've got a portfolio, you're thinking of adding something to your portfolio. You look at a back test, it looks okay, you add it, and it turns out to be a dud. That's a type one error. Okay, so, so maybe you're promised a 10% performance and it delivered zero. There's another mistake that you can make, you've got a portfolio of stuff already, you're looking at a back test, eh, it doesn't look that great, it's at the margin, you say no. You don't invest in it. And then after a couple of years, you realize you made a huge mistake. So what you thought was going to deliver zero actually delivered 10% per year. That's a type two error. Those are two different types of errors. And my idea, and, and again, I've discussed this with, with Marcos, is that you could actually go and, and talk to managers about this. So which mistake is a greater mistake? So adding something to your portfolio you thought was 10, it delivers zero, or not adding something that you thought was zero turns out to be 10. Okay, so almost everybody would take the first choice. It's the actual investment. What's more interesting is, is to change the numbers. So what if I change it instead of uh, the type two error being uh, you thought it was zero, but it added uh, 10, change it to you thought it was zero, but it actually delivered 30%. And what you do is you get the, the spot where people switch from choice A to choice B, that delivers the trade-off. And I think it'd be really interesting to compare that for the portfolio manager to the CIO of the fund and to the investor to see if there's any similarity. 
So that, that's kind of where we're going. Uh, and uh, we just need to think about this stuff, right? It's not just the T ratio. It's, you need to think about what is the trade-off. How much error are you willing to bear? Yes. I'd uh, just like to make two comments. One is that the single factors, they are not expected to work all the time, right? I think the, the job or really the art of a practitioner is to be able to identify the circumstances when it worked and be able to predict when that circumstance is gonna come again and then you're gonna Im Im uh, employ the factors. The first comment. The second comment is the, where different than the medical field is that the investment uh, world is always a going towards the, uh, the, the benchmark performance, right? For anyone who outperform a benchmark, someone is underperforming this, the benchmark. So even though if when you had that 1% or 2% factors when it worked, people are gonna start to copy you and when they do that, the alpha is gonna arbitrage away. So just two comments and one if you have any uh, yeah, comments sure. on that. Yeah, uh, sure, so uh, great, uh, great comments. Uh, so basically, you're saying that <laughs> the job of the asset manager is factor timing. Uh, it would be great if we could time these factors, uh, but let's first try to identify the factors that are real and the factors that aren't. So, so indeed, there's, there's two, I, I think of two ways of investing in a factor. One is it's a real source of risk, you know, like uh, Rob Stambaugh's work on illiquidity. I really believe that that's a source of risk. It's rewarded, something illiquid, it's got a higher expected return. Okay, some of these other ones I'm not too sure about, and my method actually maybe tries to help us uh, sort that out. Um, another way that a factor might deliver a positive expected return is if it's genuinely um, capturing mispricing. And if it is mispricing, then that mispricing could go away, as you say. Could definitely go away. Um, but I would like to take a step back first and, and talk about trying to identify, is this mispricing factor? Is this a, um, a factor that represents risk? To do that first, but I will say that um, your point about timing is actually in my method where you're looking at each point in time. So that allows for a dynamic estimation of the factor premia. So it actually captures that time variation in both risk and the risk premia. So that can be layered into this framework, but I, I don't want to go there yet. The first thing is to establish, uh, out of all of this stuff, uh, and it was striking what was said earlier that uh, how much money, one, two uh, trillion dollars on, on smart beta or all beta uh, kind of product. Like a lot of that is uh, basically investing in snake oil. So the technique that you apply, you first antagonize um, factors against uh, returns and then apply bootstrapping. Isn't it uh, effectively creating a zero sum game for the factors. So the technique will always uh, select as the best the factor that is more, most distinct, most um, unique relative to other factors. And once this factor becomes more popular, uh, it will be sort of arbitraged away, and by definition, I think, it will uh, show not as good results in the future. Yeah, so uh, again, I did the simple example, and it was just illustrative. Uh, this is, again, not what I would uh, call identifying uh, the, the true factors. It's true the way it works, you look at that one that does the best, both in the time series and the cross section, you put it in, and then the next factor, just like any regression, it's got to explain um, not the same stuff that the first factor explained, but incremental. Um, explanatory power for the time series and the cross-section of expected returns. And indeed, again, I did this panel estimation, and we don't need to do it in the panel estimation. So we can do it at every single point in time, and that might take care of some of this dynamic stuff um, that is obviously very important. Uh, indeed, it could be the case that a factor works very well in certain periods and doesn't work very well in other periods. And if we can identify that, then we've got the factor timing, right? And we can layer that into this framework. So there's a way to directly do that in the framework, and that is, and this is not uh, my idea, uh, but others' ideas, um, if we've got something that uh, is kind of 
correlated with when a factor works and doesn't work, you actually add it as another factor where it's an interaction of this new variable and the original factor. So that allows for the dynamics. Uh, and again, when we do it period by period, it allows for uh, some time variation.